Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Web Dev 101. And in this episode, what I want to talk about is what is DevOps? Okay, you might have heard this term because there's so many different possible roles in the tech space. This is just why it's so important to like just develop the skills. Like it doesn't matter uh, what language you learn, where you start. The point thing is just to start and start acclimating yourself with this knowledge. But as you start getting into sort of the, the deeper echelons or echelons, um, of the industry, there's a role called DevOps engineer that generally pays really well. It's also not necessarily the easiest role in the world, but what is it? To understand what it is, is you kind of understand sort of the history of where things kind of came from. So once upon a time, when you deployed a website, you would run your own server. Okay, so that means you would have like physical computers that you would deploy generally server software. So you'd probably install some sort of server version of Linux. Um, you would then install like an Apache server on it. So the original Apache um, project, which was a, a, a web server software that allows a, a computer to sort of serve websites. There's a, another project called Nginx that also sort of fulfills this role. So you're using, usually using one or the other. So you'd use, you'd set up the server, um, you'd get a dedicated IP address. So that way, you know, based and then that IP address would be what you would point your domain to. So basically you would have your domain registered with your registrar. It would point to that IP address um, in the DNS. That's the domain name service. The thing that matches up the name, whatever.com to an IP address where a computer lives. And essentially when everyone, someone goes to that domain, they would send it to that computer that you run uh, physically, or might be a computer that, that manages a network of computers that manages the traffic for the website. So, which is referred to as a load balancer. So a load balancer would be like the first computer that receives the request. And then you might have 10 copies of your website or 10 copies of your server software running on 10 different machines. And that load balancer would then take those requests and distribute it among those 10 machines and act as sort of uh, the intermediary so you can handle more requests at the time. Okay, and so you'd have that network of machines and then there'd be maybe other computers that act as a database. So that might have something like a Postgres or MySQL installed um, and they're handling the storage of the data for your application. Um, but essentially you end up having this network of computers that's needed to sort of run your application. Okay, and you could theoretically do it all from one machine. You could have the same machine run Postgres, run your web server. But again, you're only gonna be able to handle so many requests because your computer's doing so much and it can only do so much at the same time. So generally you end up with this big network of computers in order to scale up as you end up with bigger and bigger websites. So you would have people who would manage the stuff. So these would be like network administrators who would manage the network of computers and, and manage the, you know, the actual physical machines. You would have database administrators who would manage the database and make sure that the, that the database is running smooth and basically if some, suddenly certain queries were running slow that they would fast and these roles still exist okay there's still plenty of places that still use physical infrastructure to do a lot of these things um but nowadays what's happened is a lot of it has moved to the cloud for a variety of different reasons one it's a lower upfront cost in the sense that i don't have to go buy like a big chunk of computers and then hire someone with a very large salary to run those computers up front. Okay, oftentimes by yourself as a developer, you could probably deploy, you can deploy a website using services like AWS, Azure, um, and even easier using services like Netlify or Render. And basically all that infrastructure is sort of abstracted away from you in the cloud service. So how that, what the physical machines are, how those physical machines are in, uh, maintained, you don't have to think about that part. Okay, and then using software. Um, and so then what happens is that a lot of the automating of those virtual computers, these digital cloud computers, cloud compute um, becomes starts getting automated because if I go directly through AWS, I still, well, I don't have to maintain the physical machine. I still would set up this empty computer and I still have to install Apache on it, configure a firewall, then, you know, make get, the IP address would generally be given to you by AWS, and then you're being paying for the machine, you're paying for the IP address, you're paying for the traffic, um, which again, is still a lot less than buying the machine outright up front. Okay, so again, in the early stages, this is still a much cheaper way to go. That at some point tends to flip, depending on how you run your, your infrastructure. Um, but essentially, there's still like a lot of manual work that has to be done. So software came out, things like Docker and Kubernetes, where Docker, you could 
basically create the picture of what a machine all set up and ready to go should look like. So that way when you spin up these, you know, compute instances, these digital cloud computers, instead of you having to configure everything, you could just run a Docker container that just basically says, okay, here, this is this is what I need operating. It's set to go, done, we're good to go. Just run the Docker image, okay? But oftentimes, again, you're not running one compute instance, you might be running several compute instances. Some compute instances may be going up and going down um, dynamically. So you need something to kind of manage all of that. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. Okay, so think of, I always like to think of <clears throat> Docker or just con containers in general, because there's also things like Podman and other types of containerization. Those are more like the records in a jukebox. Okay, so you have a jukebox and you have all these different records. And if I play the right record, I hear the song that I want to hear. And then you put the jukebox allows me to select what song I want to hear and handles the switching of the records and handles all that. That's Kubernetes. Kubernetes kind of orchestrates the sort of spinning up of spinning down of compute with the right Docker containers and whatnot. So that way I can scale up and scale down my application uh, much more on a more automated way. And that's where DevOps engineers come in. They handle, they're handling the code uh, that code that they handles the dynamic scaling up and scaling down an infrastructure. So that way, when you don't need the infrastructure, you scale it down so you're not paying for what you don't need. And when you do need it, you scale up and you pay for what you do need. <clears throat> and that's still, despite, you know, again, I said there's a point where chances are probably would be cheaper to do it physically yourself. The always the catch is what happens when your needs reduce. Once you have physical infrastructure, you can't really scale down. You already have the physical infrastructure. So this is where like cloud at some points can be more expensive, but again, as soon as things turn around, you go back to being cheaper. <clears throat> so theoretically, probably on average, it ends up being the same, but theoretically still a lot easier to maintain when you're using cloud infrastructure. The catch being oftentimes each cloud provider is different. So once you've automated your application for a particular cloud provider, you're pretty locked in. That's the big catch. Like once you're all set up on AWS, it would be moving mountains to switch over. Okay, if you're really molded into sort of how AWS specifically does things. Again, there's platforms that kind of abstract the same way of doing things across multiple cloud providers. So for example, if you're using like mongodb.com to get a Mongo database, you know, the how you deploy that Mongo database to each cloud provider is abstracted away. So you don't have to worry about that. And in the future, there'll probably be more and more platforms that abstract the specific cloud provider away and you would deploy upon that, so that way you have that flexibility. But, you know, right now you just have a few. And, and even a lot of the ones that do abstract a lot of that away, oftentimes are only using one provider. Like when you're using something like Heroku, I'm pretty sure it's just basically built on top of AWS. So, but that's what a DevOps engineer is. So basically the things that they are working with are things like Docker, Kubernetes. Um, they are working with things like Terraform that allows them to write uh, code that describes the, the state of the infrastructure and sort of the rules on when you need more or less infrastructure. So that means spinning up databases. But to be a DevOps engineer, not only do you have to know these technologies, but you really have to understand the whole sort of workings of deploying an application. Sort of like, how does the database talk to an application? How does the application talk to the server? How does the server talk to uh, the end user making a request? Because you have to understand how these things connect to understand sort of how you deploy them and what infrastructure is needed to get that working, which is why it's such a highly paid job because the amount of knowledge required to truly be a, 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 a well-rounded DevOps engineer is, is quite extensive, okay? And it's generally not something where you start off uh, you start there, you oftentimes are going to start in other roles, like some sort of software development or data engineering, and you begin picking up the basics of Kubernetes and Docker uh, through these other roles. And then you grow into, you, you get to a point where you have experience working in different parts that you have this DevOps uh, capabilities. Like you can, again, you can train specifically for the role, but having that context of working other roles can really help you be a DevOps engineer because you can understand a little bit better sort of like what you're orchestrating and the context of what you're orchestrating a little bit better. So oftentimes the best data engineer, uh, the Dev DevOps engineers didn't start there. Um, especially since the role is kind of new, very few of them, most of the, most DevOps engineers are people who evolved from other roles. So it doesn't matter where you start, the industry has a lot of places you can go. Cause again, there's other roles I'll talk about in other episodes, things like product manager, developer advocate, which is the role that I fill nowadays. Um, 
that offer all sorts of different ways to take that technological knowledge that you have and kind of put it to use. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. I'll see you in the next episode. Have a great day and enjoy.